All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lacey. I am the program assistant here at the Charles Lindbergh House and Museum. And we are here for our very first Snapshot Saturday program. Um, we're talking about celebrating 50 years at the Charles Lindbergh House and Museum. Um, this is 50 years of the Minnesota Historical Society owning this property and operating this property. Um, but we're kind of going to go through and have like a history of what the land was um, pre Lindbergh and then during Lindbergh's time here, as well as kind of what the future of our site looks like um, and different um, efforts that we're doing here. Um, if you have questions, please save them for the end of the presentation and I will I will address them then. Um, but just want to start off by saying thank you to everybody that joined us for our 50th birthday party here at the museum. We had a wonderful turnout and we had several guests who had worked here from, from past times and it was really cool to talk to them um, and really talk to guests about what special memories that they had here over the last 50 years. So it was really cool. And we want to say thank you um, because without your guys' support, we wouldn't be able to do stuff like this. So um, yeah, so we'll get started. We're going to talk first about kind of the archaeology at the site. This is a very active archaeological site for the Minnesota Historical Society. Um, since the acquisition of the land by MNHS, archaeologists have done several surveys here. Um, and we've also done some excavations on the property. Um, those studies have revealed extensive activity of our land and occupation before settlers came to Little Falls. Um, so from that, there is evidence suggesting that human habitation of the site goes back over 12,000 years. Um, to, um, archaeologists have discovered artifacts that indicate that the site has had two distinct periods of occupation and belonged to several native nations here in Minnesota. Um, over the last few thousand years, the land has been home to the Dakota people um, until Ojibwe migrated to the area. The land was home to the Ojibwe people until 1847, when the United States government forcibly purchased the land in order to form a reservation centered in Long Prairie. Um, it was intended for the Ho-Chunk tribe. Um, in 1855, the Ho-Chunk uh, sought to leave the land that was forced upon them, and then the land was ceded back to the United States government, and it was officially opened for colonization at that point. So now we move to C.A. Lindbergh. So this was Charles's father. Um, he purchased the, the property in 1898 and he purchased 110 acres. Um, he did this because he had just gotten married. Um, Evangeline Lod Land Lodge was his new wife and the couple would build a home on the property. Um, the first picture here is a copy of the first Lindbergh family home that was completed in 1902. Um, it was by Little Falls Standard, a mansion at the time. Um, it was about three stories high with live-in servants quarters, running water, and electricity. Um, this home was destroyed by a fire in 1905, and another home, which you'll see in the second photo, would be built on the same foundation a year later. Um, this is the home that still stands on our property today. Unlike the first home, this one did not have running water or electricity or servants. Um, C.A. Lindbergh was a um, Minnesota congressman, and he was also a lawyer here in Little Falls. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of kind of context of who all lived here um, as far as the Lindbergh family. So you'll see the man pictured, C.A. Lindbergh. Um, he was born January 20th, 1859, um, to Ola Manson and Louisa Callen. Um, they came here from Sweden, and they became American citizens and took on the last name of Lindbergh. Um, in an effort to Americanize their names, they changed their names to um, Charles August and then their son, Charles Augustus. In 1871, CA attended school for the first time. Um, he considered himself one of the poorest students. And in 1880, he pursued further education um, under Grove Lake Academy, other, under um, Father Daniel Kogan and a few other professors. Teaching was very rigorous in this school. Um, and it, it specialized in training young men to think, think and speak for themselves. And then after that, in 1882, he would enroll in law school at the University of Michigan. 
Um, he passed the bar exam a year later and eventually came to Little Falls. Um, C.A. was married before he um, married Evangeline. Uh, her name was Mary LaFond, and um, they married in 1887. The couple had three children together, um, Evangeline, or Ava Lindbergh, and Lillian Lindbergh. Their third daughter, Edith, um, died at 10 months old in 1891. And then later in 1898, Mary LaFond um, died of complications after abdominal surgery. And then in 1901, C.A. would remarry to Evangeline Lodge Land. Um, she was a high school teacher here in Little Falls, and they would have one son together, um, Charles Augustus Lindbergh. Um, C.A. was a practicing lawyer in Little Falls, as well as holding a seat in the United States House of Representatives. Um, when World War I broke out in 1914, Lindbergh was a very strong opponent of U.S. intervention in a European affair. Um, because of his isolationist beliefs, he lost his seat in the House of Representatives in 1960 or 1916, excuse me. And he also wrote anti-war um, books. One was titled Why Your Country at War? Why is your country at war? Um, he was also a huge um, opponent of the Federal Reserve. And in 1913, he published another book um, titled Banking Currency and the Money Trust. Um, and then in 1918, under the Comstock laws, federal agents destroyed the printing plates along with that book, um, which attacked the Federal Reserve and big banks. And it wasn't until 1934 that this book was republished. Um, it's also important to note that he also ran unsuccessfully for governor of Minnesota in 1918 and in 1924. Um, he did die in 1924 of a brain tumor, so he did not see that campaign through. Um, and then we move on to Charles's mother, who is Evangeline Lodge Land. Um, she was born in Detroit to Dr. Hen or Charles Henry Land and Evangeline Lodge Land. Um, she attended a private school called Miss Leggett's, where she became an accomplished pianist. In 1899, she also graduated from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, with a Bachelor of Science degree that majored in chemistry. In 1900, Evangeline read about Little Falls, Minnesota and Captain Willard Glazer's Down the Great River and wanted to pursue a teaching job there. That same year, um, she, when she came to Little Falls, she met uh, C.A. Lindbergh and described him as the brightest lawyer in Minnesota. And after a short courtship, they married in 1901. Um, in February of 1902, Charles Augustus Lindbergh was born. Um, after losing the first family home to a fire, Evangeline and C.A.'s marriage fell apart. And in 1920, um, Charles and his mother moved to Madison, Wisconsin, so Charles could attend college. Um, Evangeline taught physical science in one of the local junior high schools. In 1922, she took graduate courses in education at Columbia, and then she returned to teaching in Detroit at a high school. Um, she would spend the rest of her life teaching both in Detroit and she also went to Turkey to teach. Um, she died at the age of 78 in Detroit after battling Parkinson's disease. And then moving on to Charles's um, half-sisters, Lillian and Ava. Um, after their mother had passed, T.A. Lindbergh hires a kindergarten teacher to look after his children. Um, after he met and married Evangeline, um, they, they did not get along well. Ava details events of physical and verbal abuse by Evangeline. Um, Lillian graduated from high school and then attended the University of Michigan and the University of Minnesota before meeting uh, Lauren Roberts. The two would marry and have one daughter. And then in March of 1916, Lillian would become ill with tuberculosis. Um, she was admitted to a hospital in California and, and passed away on November 4th, 1916. Uh, she was only 28 years old. Ava Lindbergh would graduate from Carleton College in 1914, and she taught in Akeley, Minnesota. Ava would also work with her father um, at his law office until 1916. In 1916, Ava married George West Christie, and together they would edit and publish the Red Lake Falls Gazette. The couple welcomed their first daughter in 1917, Lillian Lindbergh Christie, and in 1922, their son George West Christie Jr. was born. The couple would publish and edit the newspaper until 1956 when George passed away. Um, George Sr. passed away. In 1970, Ava remarried um, G. Howard Spaeth, a Minnesota tax commissioner, um, and then began uh, Ava began her involvement with the Minnesota Historical Society on the acquisition of the Lindbergh family home in Little Falls. 
Charles and his sister Ava would help the historical society set up the historic home and also tell the story of, of what our now house tour looks like. Um, so the family, uh, after C.A. lost his congressional seat, the Lindbergh family had to stay in Little Falls. Um, and they did, C.A. believed that it would be most beneficial to start farming for the war effort. Um, chickens were a large part of the Lindbergh farm during World War I. Um, it is speculated that Charles hatched between 1,000 and 6,000 chickens during the three years that he farmed. It's really hard to settle on a number there um, because tracking wasn't the most efficient back then. Um, after the chicks had hatched, they moved here. Um, they moved where they would grow and feed um, waste products. And then when they were large enough, they would be shipped by market or shipped by rail to market in Minneapolis. Um, they primarily raised chickens for the market, but the Lindberghs also butchered and consumed their own chickens. Fried chickens seem to have been a notable meal for the Lindberghs. Mrs. Lindberg uh, mentions it three times in her letters and journals. Um, raising chickens for meat grew in popularity during the war. Um, before World War I, Americans didn't usually eat chickens. They weren't a popular poultry item. Um, in addition to raising chickens, the Lindberghs also maintained a small flock of geese and ducks. Um, they also had Duroc Jersey pigs, they had um, a lot of small animals here on the farm. Uh, Charles would primarily run the farm with a tenant farmer. Despite the war ending in 1918, he ran the farm until 1920 when he left for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, a little bit of a note there, uh, Charles would con only last at the University of Madison-Wisconsin for about a year, and then he would... Um, pursue various aviation endeavors. He went to Nebraska to learn how to fly, and he also enlisted in the um, Army Air Corps. Um, after 1927, Charles, or in 1927, Charles Lindbergh made his historic transatlantic flight, where he became the most famous man in the world, um, your first modern celebrity, and people wanted a, like a, a piece of him and a, and a piece of his history. So the home in Little Falls became badly damaged by souvenir hunters. Um, childhood friend of Charles Lindbergh's, Martin Enstrom recalls, quote, people were just wild. They acted like they were mad. He'd landed there in Paris. And the minute he landed over there, I loaded up a bunch of lumber, nails, and some padlocks, and I came down to the home. So Martin Enstrom would board up the windows. He went down to the basement and put a big bar across the double garage doors and nailed it down with some 20 penny nails. Um, he was pretty satisfied that nobody could get into the house. Um, but then he said, I hadn't been home more than a half hour. And somebody called up and said, you know, people are in the home down there. So he got back in his truck and he went down and there were all kinds of people. Um, they boosted a guy up and cracked the big window in the living room. The souvenir seekers damaged the woodwork of the house by carving names. They broke multiple windows and took what was left of the Lindbergh's furnishings and even removed stones from the foundation. Um, a little shout out with these photos here. We got them from the Morrison County Historical Society. These are brand new photos um, to the museum. We had never seen them before and we don't have a really... Um, good documentation of the vandalism that occurred there um, as far as photographs. But you can see in, in the photographs that there are names written on the side of, of the house, as well as some of the destruction on the back of the house, including the big bar that was there. Um, so the most heavily damaged item of the house was the family's uh, 1916 Saxon automobile. Um, the engine block was removed along with the car's furnishings that exposed the entire skeleton of the car. And then you'll see that in this photo here. Um, in 1927, Charles Lindbergh returned to the site um, and was here with his mother for as part of his goodwill tour. And that was in August of 1970 or 1927. Um, and the people of Little Falls here decided to spray paint that on the side of his car and then they put it in a parade in his honor. So that is what the car looked like. Um, so in the 1930s, uh, Charles, in 1931, Charles donated his boyhood home and the whole 110 acre farmland that his family owned to the state of Minnesota. Um, and then the state would take on doing the repair work. The Works Progress Administration, which was a... Um, a program that was developed by FDR as part of his New Deal. Um, 
decided to take on majority of the restoration work. So this happened May 21st, 1936. The work would begin um, between the, the home and the neighboring state park. The project was given about $23,770. Um, today, that would approximate about $506,000. The project employed 40 to 50 summertime workers. And upon approval of the project, the house was going to get a new coat of paint, um, numerous repairs to the grounds that included replacing the missing foundation stones. Um, and they also did a lot of environmental work around the home. So this included protecting the soil um, from erosion with rock walls that created footpaths. Um, in a letter from Martin Enstrom to Charles Lindbergh, Enstrom reported that more than 21,000 trees were planted at the historic home and that the, in, and in the neighboring state park. And then um, white Jack, Norway pine, box elders, and elms were also planted. Um, blackberry and hackberry bushes were also planted to attract birds. Um, so, so this is photos of the house post WPA restoration. Um, this would be right around 1936. Um, so the, the house was in a much better condition after the WPA took over. Um, and then the restoration of the state park. So when uh, Charles Lindbergh donated the 110 acres in 1931, um, he had um, told them that he wanted half of this to be a state park in honor of his father. A lot of people don't know that the state park is actually named after his father and not him himself. Um, so that's what it was developed into. And then WPA came in and did work for recreation areas. Um, one of the first buildings to be added was a log kitchen shelter that's located um, west of the Lindbergh home in the state park. Um, and there's also a large granite water tower that was constructed to provide water to small restroom buildings and water fountains. Um, known originally as the kitchen shelter, this was one of the first new buildings to be constructed in Lindbergh State Park. Minnesota Conservation Magazine described, quote, the peeled pine logs, the rustic doors, and the great stone fireplace make it a fine example of woodcraft. Behind the fireplace is a large stove for cooking purpose, solid and well-built. The structure still stands today. Um, this structure was also replicated in Bemidji State Park. One of the last WPA structures to be built was the limestone water tower, um, referred to by the WPA as the, the water house. It was constructed in the summer of 1939. It was built of... Uh, native granite. The tower held 5,000 gallons of water, um, which was pumped into the restroom, the water fountain, and the caretaker's residence. The structure st is still there today, although it's not used as a water source. Um, according to 1937 progress report on the park development, shelters were built along the foot trails to give protection in the event um, that visitors exploring the trails encounter terrible weather. Um, by the time the construction con was completed, there were several several shelters of various sizes and designs throughout the park. Um, but because of contact with the ground, shelters with significant wood um, elements would decompose over time. The stone ruin located about 100 yards north of the Lindbergh home is the only surviving park shelter today. Um, the WPA work was not responsible for the, the family's 1916, um, the restoration of the Saxon. This would actually be... Um, done by Camp Ripley. The restoration work, work took over 5,000 man hours. Um, Sar Sergeant James Bakula was responsible for it and um, also for the reconstruction of the six cylinder engine. Um, Sergeant Pakula drove the reconstructed Saxon to the Lindbergh home where it is currently sitting on display and, and will stay here on display. So now we get to our ownership of the Minnesota Historical Society. During the 1960s, MNHS President uh, Russell Fridley and the DNR began discussions around the acquisition of Lindbergh's childhood home. Um, previously, the state park staff would care for the historic home. Um, this created a few issues because people could freely walk in and out of the home without supervision, um, which resulted in some damages and theft. Um, after the plan became solidified and MNHS acquired the property, um, more restoration work on the home would begin. Um, a plan was also made to build an interpretive center that would discuss the Lindbergh family as a whole. Both um, Charles and Ava felt that the interpretive center should center more around CA as well as other mem members of the Lindbergh family. Um, 
Charles wanted it to be more of a county historical society, which didn't end up happening. That happened down the road from us. Um, the interpretive center was um, set up with three levels with ramps up to each level. At the top would be the Spirit of St. Louis and a replica of the Spirit of St. Louis and information about the infamous infamous flight. Um, over time, though, we've had our re exhibits redone. Um, the exhibits became less focused on the Lindbergh family and more focused on um, Charles himself. Uh, Charles attended the opening of the Interpretive Center on September 30th, 1973. In his dedication speech, Charles talked a lot about the conservation of different Minnesota parks, um, as well as um, how we can help conservation efforts around here. Uh, Charles stated, I wish my father could have known the land he chose largely because of its beauty would eventually become a park, thereby implementing his vision and early interest in the conservation of nature and natural resources. Nothing would have pleased, them more, pleased him more than the knowledge that thousands of people each year are going to enjoy his old home. Um, the dedication speech of the Interpretive Center would be one of last, or Charles's last public speeches before he died in August of 1974. Um, after his death, Anne and Charles, or after his death, Anne and the Lindbergh children would continue to, to visit often and keep in touch with the staff. Lindbergh, um, him, we talked about Lindbergh himself having a lot of influence in the way we developed our programming here, as well as his sister. Um, he did make quite a few site visits here um, between 19, late 1960s and into the 1970s before his death. So there are some photos here of Charles at the park having breakfast um, with some of our faculty at MNHS and then walking the state park as well. Um, so a little bit about the future, what, what we can expect from the Lindbergh site. We actually have the 100th anniversary of um, the transatlantic flight coming up in just actually a few short years in 2027. Um, here at the museum, we're going to be doing a special outdoor screening of The Spirit of St. Louis, the film starring Jimmy Stewart. Um, and there's also our digital suite that we just launched. So if there are ever programs or parts of Lindbergh's life that you're super curious about, we do have a digital suite with our programs on um, crime of the century, the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. Um, we have Lindbergh 101, which is a brief overview of Lindbergh's life. We have the aviator's wife, um, Anne Morrow Lindbergh. If you don't know much about Anne Morrow, she is uh, very well accomplished in her own right. Uh, Lindbergh in America First is where we talk a lot about Lindbergh during World War II, the things that he said that he did that still have standing implications today. Um, and then the last one being birds rather than airplanes. This is all about Charles Lindbergh's environmental work throughout the world um, from his vocal um, green light of establishing Voyagers National Park here in Minnesota um, to advocating for uh, animal protections in the Philippines. And then we have our own kind of conservation efforts here in Minnesota or here at the site. The WPA and the MNHS have already done a, an amazing amount of restoration work on the Lindbergh home. Um, historic preservation is, is always an ongoing task. Um, in 2020, a series of thunderstorms in the area caused a mudslide in the back of our historic home. Um, that took out the original retaining wall with it. So MNHS, along with FEMA, put a brand new concrete wall in its place. Um, so this ensured that the historic home would be safe from further movement. Um, if you have been to our site in the last few years, you probably have, have noticed the condition of, of the ice house on the property, which um, we have a big issue with soil erosion. Um, and this is an issue that's, that's not only impacting us but impacting another site as well down the road, and that is the Morrison County Historical Society. Um, but we are actively losing our ice house over an embankment. So we have been diligently working with um, engineers, uh, our own institution to save this ice house from falling, basically falling over. Um, but this is an ongoing project. Um, Together we can, we'll be able to save it. So your continued support of historic sites ensures that our museum will be around for future generations to enjoy. Um, and then we of course have all of our off season programming, our Snapshot Saturday series, which this is a part of. Our next program is November 11th at one, and this is Dreams Take Flight. 
This is all about early aviation um, before Lindbergh's 1927 transatlantic flight. If you love aviation history, this is the program for you. Um, if you don't know much about aviation history, this is a really good program that'll help you understand why Lindbergh's flight was so game-changing for aviation. Um, so it'll be, it'll be a really good one. Um, we do have more up, upcoming programs as well. In December, we're doing Leaving the Nest, where our intern, Connor, is going to talk about Charles's relationship with his parents. Um, so this will be a good context into getting, you know, all of, all of what went into Charles's childhood and how it influenced him later in his life as well. Um, and then in January, we're doing Crime of the Century, which is all about the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. And this will be a good program leading up to our February Snapshot Saturday, because we're actually having an author come and talk about um, a book that is a historical fiction book about the Lindbergh baby kidnapping um, from the perspective of Charlie Jr.'s nurse, Betty Gow. Um, we can definitely give you the link to that book. It'll be worth a worth a read before she comes and at, talks to us. That way, if you have questions, she'll be able to answer them. And then we'll do a Meet the Lindberghs, which is all about C.A. Lindbergh's families, because we get a lot of questions about C.A. Lindbergh, where he came from, and the controversy in Sweden that his father encountered and forced him to move to the United States. So if you want to know about that. And then April, we have not decided what we're going to do, but stay tuned. We will announce that soon. Um, so yeah, now we can take some questions if anybody has any. I'd be happy to answer them. Awesome. Well, we have um, our Christmas program coming up as well at the end of November and the first weekend in December. Um, if you are around Little Falls, we are part partner with the community every year and put on these um, Christmas programs with other historic homes. This year, we will be launching a very new Christmas program um, where we are going to be talking about Charles Lindbergh's life as a whole rather than just his childhood. Um, every home of the or every room in the historic home will be decorated as a different country where Charles either lived or where he had major influence. Um, and we'll be going through Christmas traditions around the world as well. So that starts pretty soon. Keep an eye out for it.